Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jamila Bukwala. I'm Dean of the Faculty at Lafayette, for those of you who don't know, and I'm also Chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. Um, the, we call it affectionately the DEI Council, and we are working hard partnering with other, um, other parts of campus, including the Office of Intercultural Development, CITLS, the library, our faculty, athletics, academics, the academic division that is including our faculty, public safety. We're having conversations at all times and this is part of that. Currently, we are trying to have some programming every week this summer to, to really address anti-Black racism, racial justice, um, and think about ways that we can make a difference. Each of us can make a difference. And, we have another event on Monday um, uh, that will be led by Professor Vora and uh, our library colleague, Ben Jerry, uh, who will talk about media literacy and how important it is at this time. Uh, uh, you know, and so please do, do try to log in for that as well. We also have a program coming up on the 7th of July that um, Dean Tracy Addy is going to lead on anti-Black racism in teaching and learning, and how do we make sure that we are doing all the right things in, our, in the classroom and, and outside the classroom when we engage with our students and with one another as colleagues. Um, so, so without um, further delay, let me say that I am so very grateful to Professor Wendy Wilson Fall for bringing to campus Dr. Jennifer Yanko. Um, uh, as you know, Professor Wilson Fall is the chair of our Africana Studies program Dr. Yanko is affiliated with the African Studies Program at Boston University, and they are going to lead a very important conversation hour today um, on a time for repair, what cost racial justice. We will have um, their dialogue initially, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, we will, I will actually call on um, uh, you if you will raise your hand um, I ask that we, uh, we be patient with one another. And also I do wanna give our students who are on this um, call the opportunity to speak. Sometimes um, they, uh, you know, they may get overshadowed by all of us who are quite happy to, to talk. And so I am going to first ask for our students uh, if they have any um, questions or comments for our speakers and then we'll open it up to everyone now. So I don't want to delay this any further, but simply to say thank you to our speakers and thanks to all of you for being here. Do get in touch with the council. We are at DEI council at lafayette.edu if you have thoughts, concerns, ideas for how we can work together. Thank you, Wendy, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Bukwala. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here um, and thank the DEI council also for sponsoring this. I'm very happy that uh, we've been able to respond so quickly to these very distressing e events that have sort of woken everybody up. And not that we're woke yet, but we <laughs> it did wake us up to how distressing and um, really contingent the, our peace is upon us being able to respond to, to, to the anxieties and troubles in our society. So I'm happy to welcome uh, Dr. Yanko, who um, started out as a linguist and then ended up at the School of Public Health at Harvard. So she has a very uh, broad background. And some years ago, I think it's 20 years, she started an organization called White People Challenging Racism in Cambridge, Mass. So the first question I'm going to ask you, Dr. Yanko, is to tell us a little bit about your work and white people challenging racism. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I want to just begin by thanking Lafayette College, Dean Bukwala, the DEI, and you, Professor Wilson Fall, for inviting me. I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, to discuss and exchange around these really critical issues, because I think that's the way that um, I can learn more and hopefully we can all learn more. And, and I wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements before uh, directly addressing your question. Um, and that is a, a sort of dilemma because in, in talking about 
racism and white supremacy is critical to center the voices of people of color because they're the ones that are most impacted by white supremacy. And at the same time, since this is white people's problem, as the Kerner Commission concluded more than 50 years ago, white people, white institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. So in that sense, it's white people and white society that needs to take the lead in clearing it out and not depend on black, indigenous, and people of color to do it. So I'm sort of taking the second tack today as a, as a white person, um, because I think that it's fundamentally white people's work. And we're, we're fortunate that people of color are willing to call us out and to hold us accountable. And we're very fortunate in this moment, as Kimberly Jones so forcefully put it, that we're just lucky that what black people want is equality and not revenge. That's pretty chilling, but I, it, I think it's really important. So anyway, to go uh, and talk a little bit briefly um, about white people challenging racism, I, I sort of think of it as um, a way of interrupting white supremacy and activating other white people, you know, sort of following the injunction of uh, Malcolm X to go out to your own community. Uh, you know, stop trying to help us, just go fix your community. So they'll stop, uh, they'll stop oppressing us. Um, so the idea is to really activate white people and white communities to take constructive action. And so it's a sort of three pronged uh, workshop. It focuses on awareness, so raising awareness, learning about our history, learning about how we're implicated in a very, um, not only academic way, but also in a very personal, visceral way, how we are embodying this. Um, coming up with an action plan, that is something that you can do in your community that's going to make a change. And often, these can be very small things. They can be things like changing the um, hiring policies in your workplace. So th there's a, quite a range. And then and the, uh, the third integral part of this workshop series is practice, sort of the praxis, where we, we're trying to embody something else. And when you learn a new language or when you learn a dance, you have to do it. You can't just you know, read about learning Arabic. You have to actually say it, make mistakes, fall down if you dance. So I think that becoming an anti-racist, adopting this, trying to transform ourselves to be active in the struggle and dismantling white supremacy requires that kind of practice. So that's um, basically sort of what this workshop focuses on. And I have to say over the years, it started very modestly in 1999, with no intention that it would be more than one run. And here we are 20 years later with sort of well over 1,500 people who have taken it, probably closer to 2,000 now. And many of whom have made action plans and have gone out and done them. So they're sort of like the, you know, the dropping the pebble in the pond. Um, and it's been sort of humbling to see how that's, that small action has triggered others. So that's, that's basically sort of Thank where you. it came from. So from your viewpoint of the, this 20 years of um, organizing these workshops where you actually are perhaps engaging with people's fears, with people's aspirations, um, how would you characterize the current moment that we're living through now since the death of George Floyd? And I think, yeah. And others, yeah. I think the word that comes to mind for me is a time of reckoning. You know, that to me is a very dramatic sort of term, a term, a time of reckoning. Like it's time to look at what's really going on and decide where you stand on it. And I think that's true for each of us as individuals. It's true for our, inst you know, the institutions that we belong to, and it's true for us as a society. And I think that. As a time of reckoning, it's also a time of opportunity. It's a, it's a turning point. And as so many other people have noticed and mentioned, 
and underlined, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., th this is an opportunity for change, but can we take it? And we've had so many opportunities where, where society is like really at a turning point and there was a chance to go one way and it seemed that there was a critical mass and then it just fell off. Um, I think it's a little bit different this time. I'm hopeful, cautiously hopeful, because one of the, um, one of the mechanisms, I think, of white supremacy, at least in white culture, the one I grew up in, is that we don't know anything about it. You know, oh, that's terrible. It's too bad. Well, I'm a nice person. I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about the history. I don't know about Tulsa. I don't like about Rosewood. I don't know about what happened with 40 Acres and the Mule. I don't know what happened with the Farm Administration Extension agents. I don't know any of that. So, uh, you know, I, that sort of shields me because I don't know anything about it. But I think right now we're not there. We know about it. You'd have to be really, um, really sequestering yourself away from the world not to know what's going on. So, and to start knowing about history. So I think in that sense, this is an incredible moment. And I've seen amazing things just locally in the town I'm in, like hordes of young people um, participating in the city budget discussions, much to the chagrin of some of the more conservative members of the council. But, you know, people are, are out there and they're using their voices. I don't mean to diminish the, the strength of the backlash, which is, it's just there. But I think that the knowledge, the information is available for once. And the culture is changing in a way that it's okay to speak out. It's okay to take action. Whereas 20 years ago, when this white people challenging racism, moving from dark to action started, people would come up to me and say, oh, thank you for this, having a place to talk about this. I have no place to talk about racism. Well, that's, that's not the case anymore. Um, if I could interrupt you for mm -hmm. one, could you share just a little bit about this phenomenon of powerlessness that the, you encountered in some of your discussions that you've talked to me about before? Uh, How people felt powerless? It's such an interesting irony that many people don't think about that uh, white people would feel powerless in the face of racism. Right, well, I think that we're, we're raised, and again, this may be changing, I, I hope, at least in significant numbers. Um, we're raised in white communities not to really know anything about racism. I'm not talking about my generation, which I realize is somewhat prehistoric, but, um, you know, we don't know anything about it. You know, it's some terrible problem that seems to exist among particularly African Americans. and. Um, you know, it's a terrible thing and we feel horrible about it, but we don't really, we don't know anything about it. In fact, I can, you know, cite myself here. When I was asked, I was invited to come up with a workshop on racism for white people. And my first reaction was, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. What, what? I don't know anything about racism. I'm a white person. And then it, as it sunk in what I was telling myself or what my brain or whatever my acculturation was telling me was was completely a way of perpetuating white supremacy because if I couldn't know anything about it then I couldn't possibly do anything about it and then I started realizing of course I know a lot about it of course I know a lot about it I live here um, you know I interact with people I am part of institutions but there is that sense or there has been that sense that it's not our place to speak about it it's, you know, that's someone else's problem. We don't know too much about it and we should just, you know, it's too bad. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so um, as you've characterized this current moment, what do you think this moment requires? Well, this is where I think we really, uh, again, I have sort of one, focus as the moment seems to be a time of reckoning. The, what it requires of us, I think, is uh, repair. 
we need to repair the situation. We have another opportunity. Are we going to take it this time or not? That's the question. And I think that um, what's really been helpful to me is just to think about repair, which is related to reparations, of course. We need to seriously consider reparations, which have been considered many times in the past, reparations to those who were enslaved or now to those who are those communities that have descended from those who were enslaved and who have gone through, you know, Jim Crow and mass incarceration and continued, continued um, oppression. Um, so anyway, I like to think of it like as repairing, like if you have a house that you have to repair. I mean, anybody who has a house knows that you have to constantly repair it or it's going to fall down. And, and to, you know, if you need, to, if there's something that needs to be repaired in your house, and I'm using this house as like our society. There's obviously it's crumbling. It's, it's a mess. It's in a moment of upheaval. So we, it's incumbent upon us to repair it. And so in order to repair something, you have to do the research and the study to understand what the problem is. And that's a big challenge for us. It's much less so now because all you have to do, you can go online for days and days on end and learn and learn and learn. You can hear uh, people of color, African Americans talking about it. You can hear historians talking about it. You can hear and see, there's just so much information. So doing the research um, is the first step. What is wrong with it? And what do I need to know? What understandings do I need to have to make reasonable decisions about how to act? And I think that requires that we be open to actually transforming ourselves with this new information. You know, I mean, this is sort of trivial, but say your chimney's falling down, you have to become an expert, you know, about chimneys. So that's, you're a different person then. It's trivial, but, um, but the idea is that as we see, we have to be willing to hear things that we didn't believe or we hear from the people who are most affected. You know, like we have to be able to listen with the idea that we might have to say, well, hmm, that doesn't jive with my experience, but well, what if it's true? So there's that research piece. Then I think there's the piece um, of the actual repair. And again, I want to return to Dr. King. When he was talking, you know, he didn't use the term reparations that, uh, to my knowledge, but he was talking about that. He said after the passing of the Civil Rights Act, he said, you know, it was a cheap fix to give us access to the ballot box. That was great, but it was a cheap one. Now comes the serious business. We had to fix the schools. We had to fix the neighborhoods. We had to fix the uh, housing. We had to fix jobs, you know, just like all of those things. And that's going to cost a lot of money. And they actually came up with figures. And the longer you wait to repair the problem in your house, the more expensive it gets. And we've waited a long time. And I have a feeling now, I just have the sense that this moment of reckoning is like, this is when it's going to fall down. If, if this is the last chance to fix it, and it's going to be way more expensive than it would have been to give everybody 40 acres and a mule. But, but we've, we, we need to appreciate that it's not going to be cheap and it's going to cost us, especially those of us who have benefited all along, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us a lot. And are we, are we willing to make that investment for our own good and for the good of the whole society. I don't know, but it's, I think it's really important to realize that this is, this is not a cheap fix. This is not like, oh, I guess I'll just be really nice and I'll um, help out with you know, some building projects. Uh, this is like serious business. And then uh, I think the third part of reparations or repair is that it's not going to go the way you expect it to go. It never does. Some glitch comes up um, and you have to be willing to, to stay in it for the long haul until it's done, until it's done right. Um, maybe, maybe that done right is something that is um, an aspirational thing that won't ever, we won't ever quite get there, but we, it behooves us to keep going. Um, so I, I guess that um, I really feel like this is the moment of 
for reparations. It's not the moment for being nice or just finding out about things. Um, it, it's really the time for serious, serious reparations. And lots of people have talked about it. Dr. King talked about it a lot. And, you know, a book just came out called, what is it? I'm actually in the process of reading it. From Here to Equality on Reparations. Um, that's uh, great. I mean, people have been talking about reparations for time immemorial, but I think that for once that the discussion is actually hit the mainstream. You know, people are actually like, oh, what is it? And we hear very, we don't hear as many people saying, well, uh, how would we know if the person really was descended from a slave we, to give them a check? I mean, how would we really, what if they were lying? <laughs> you know, we don't hear that kind of reaction so much now. I think people are taking it more seriously. So you wrote a book, Misremembering Dr. King. Mm -hmm. And um, in that book, you point out to a lack of empathy among white people as key in the persistence of white supremacy. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Well, I think Dr. King also talked a lot about a lack of compassion, which I think is related to a lack of empathy. And this growing up in segregated communities, in um, a white supremacy culture, and it's not just white people that grow up in that culture, we all do, um, but we benefit from it much more than others. Um, we're, we're not encouraged to empathize or to see ourselves in the shoes of people who don't look like us. And there was a recently, a really interesting, um, I don't know if it was a blog post or what, I've lost track of the zillions of things that are passing through, um, about reading and children reading and adults too, like reading, white people reading novels about just like ordinary black people are just going about their lives or Asian Americans or, and children having books that have lots of different characters in them that are just living their lives and so that so that we we can empathize and put ourselves in their shoes and it's interesting because people of color are much more able in my experience to empathize with white people than vice versa and it's because they're they're in the same culture you know they're reading all the books seeing all the movies where most of the characters are white so you know that's um a, that helps people be able to empathize when you see people just living their lives. And, and because we live in a segregated society, a lot of people don't have the opportunities to, to actually know each other just as next door neighbors, you know, person that's, you know, see when you walk down the block. Um, and I think it's also um, sort of an indifference that's born of this, this lack of empathy, which is part of the not knowing and I think that um, Jim Keenan's video, which um, some of you have probably watched, I think he was right into calling this willful ignorance. There's a, there's a level at which it's willful ignorance. And I've been thinking about this empathy a lot for the last um, several days, especially in thinking about this um, conversation with you all. And I was talking with, um, a friend of mine who has written a book on empathy and written a number of articles about racism and empathy. And, um, you know, she mentioned Carl Rogers, and I know that Dean Bookwell probably is much more of an expert of the, in this than I am, but it, his, one of his definitions of empathy was sort of interesting to me, and I have to sort of object to it. He may have, this was just one thing so it, it's taken out of context, but he was saying, you know, to really empathize, you have to leave yourself behind and be secure enough that you can leave yourself behind and enter into the other person's reality. And this is the part that I think is sort of problematic, knowing that if, you know, th this other reality that may be very bizarre and strange, you can leave it and go back to your own. But I think in this case, we can't. And we mustn't, you know, we're empathizing, hearing, learning about other people's experience that goes completely counter to what we've been taught and what we believe. Like we believe that the police are our friends. 
they've always been so friendly. If I call them, they'll come and help me. I don't, I, you're wrong. You, I don't, you must be mistaken. To be able to say, I mean, and that's an example that most of us are not going to use, but there are lots of other places where we say, well, you know, that's, that, you know, it just doesn't jive with my experience, so I can't accept it. But I think we have to be able to say, oh, what if, and not say, well, I'll just go back to my comfortable reality. I can be transformed by understanding that the way society is set up means that we have very different experiences. So, um, Are there I any think a lot of it's just learning and listening, encountering the kind of socialization that we've had. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, in fact, you're, what you're saying is that many of us may have some anecdotes to relate, but the way that we perceived those situations may be very much conditioned by our positionality. Yes. And so we may be looking at the same phenomenon. Exactly. But looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. Because we're living it very differently. Mm -hmm. And I think part of white supremacy is a resistance to accept that. Mm -hmm. You know, no, they possibly can't be. Uh, an example I think of is um, how uh, the, the, the lack of mobility for black people, especially black males, yes. uh, being the mother of two adult sons, they really, I mean, I was walking in the, uh, at the park the other day, uh, the Carl Steiner uh, art trio with one of them. And I realized he had never been there. And I realized that he would not go there freely because he wouldn't feel secure as a sole black man walking alone in the park that he might be suspect of something. And he just wants to avoid any possible uh, trouble. I mean, I also don't go by myself for gendered reasons, which is why I try to get him to go with me. But um, it just hit me, there, there's this lack of mobility. Um, I know when my nephew was living in Silver Spring, he was stopped several times by the police to show his ID and he was a block away from his house in Woodmore. So where there is mobility for uh, black people, and particularly men, is also where there's crime and where there are high densities of police, which is the black neighborhood. But then when black people are in more diverse neighborhoods, they are still in danger mm -hmm. because everybody wants to know why are they there? And, and are they dangerous or are they safe black people? And I often think about our students and I say that to sort of segue into the, into the question uh, portion of this. I think about our students who are of color and how they are living a much more constrained life and have always lived a more constrained life uh, in terms of what neighborhoods they might go in or not what restaurants they might try to go in or not, uh, when they try to go certain places. And it's very hard for, for people to imagine a sort of li living in that reality. To me, it's an example of we're all living in the same reality, but we're seeing it very differently. So can you say a few words of closing? Uh, then we're gonna open up. Okay, I really like what you just said because that was, um, it's something that I think we've talked about before that this assumption that we, that we as white people have that we can all just sort of move freely through society. I can go to the store, I can go walking, I can drive. And that what has been happening to African descended people since they first arrived here in bondage is that they cannot and they must not move freely through society. There's always somebody waiting to to trip them up and it can you know it continues yeah and it is and then again it raises the issue of empathy can can we can we 
even imagine what that's like if it's not if it's not our experience and do we want to that's another question do we really want to go there because it's painful and it's hurtful and it requires that we do something so I, I did want to say one more thing quickly, um, which is I wanted just to refer to this wonderful article by Arundhati Roy that came out in the Financial Times. It was it was only related to COVID-19 because it was before everything else sort of blew up. And she was talking about how pandemics really force people to make a break with the past and go somewhere else. And I just want to read her closing words because I thought I think they're a guide for us in a way she said we can choose to walk through it that portal she could call it a portal the pandemic is a portal I think we can look at the upheaval as part of that portal we can choose to walk through it dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred our avarice our data banks and dead ideas our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. That's a great quote. Thank you so much. Sure. So very much. So I don't know, maybe Dean Bukwala will now lead us to the second phase of this uh, program. Yeah, I, I just want to thank both of you. Uh, uh, my sense is that the rest of those of us who are on this call listening to you talk uh, are feeling uh, moved, um, uh, you know, better informed, and really hopefully ready to act, to make change. And with that, I, so I'll say a very big thank you on behalf of all of us and open it up to questions. Again, I ask that you raise your hand and I'm gonna ask that our students go first. So if we have students on the call, um, please raise your hand and I will call on you. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to hear from both our speakers. And so, um, raise away. Anyone? Um, Mike Scott. Mike Scott, I'm, I'm going to, was I able to, I thought Thank I- you. Yep, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very, very good. I, would, I was hoping that you could clarify um, or, or straighten out for me something that seemed like a contradiction to me. So if you could help me put my, my head around that. Um, you started with, with uh, sort of alluding to the idea uh, that Malcolm X put out in terms of stop helping us and focus on your own community. Um, but then we, got, then we got into the idea of reparations where it seems to me that there's some contradictory notion there um, that, that, in a way, that in a way we want to you know, you know, help more. So can you help me understand how those two things um, Co coincide with each other, how they how they work, um, and, and are not actually contradictory. Um, should I go ahead? Yes. Sure. And then I might uh, I might uh, chime in at the end. Okay. Um, I I can see where you might consider that to be um, a contradiction. Um, what Malcolm X was saying is there's not a lot wrong with white communities. And what white people need to focus on is fixing those communities. Well, I would say that reparations is part of fixing those communities because what we think about when we think about white supremacy and racism, we think about all the horrible things that it does to people of color, which is true. It does do horrible things. But that's a, that's a byproduct of amassing and hoarding all the resources. I mean, white supremacy is designed not necessarily to hurt anyone, although it certainly does, it's designed to get all the resources in the few hands, in the white, people, white people's hands. So I think that um, reparations, writing this, correcting this imbalance is, is not helping, so like helping communities of color, it's fixing what's wrong in white communities, which is, which, which is that we're holding on to all the resources. I mean, if you look at the wealth gap, it's amazing. And it's very clearly traceable to 
history and institutions and actions of our government and our communities. So it's, it's fixing, it's, um, as I think Jim Keenan put it, excuse the language, fixed your shit. So it's not helping, it's fixing, and in my sense. I would just like to chime in that also that I think part, part of the work that needs to be done is for, for, for whites to understand you're not doing this just for black people. Mm -hmm. You're doing this for yourself so that you can look out in the world differently so that your children live in a different uh, reality. Uh, and it's not just uh, what you're doing for people of color, but what you're gaining by changing your relationship uh, to other people. But I see there are other hands. Yes, we have, uh, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, we have uh, Lulu Kachuk. I hope I'm saying that right. You can unmute yourself. Hi. Um, my question is that you <clears throat> you mentioned before that it's not the time to be nice and that it's time for reparations. And then you mentioned that it's the time for white people to be willing to listen and learn. But I find a lot of difficulty with um, white people trying to listen, especially on Lafayette's campus. And I'm wondering how you can urge people to listen to the stories that they need to listen to, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. I'd just like to at first uh, respond to that it's not a time to be nice. It doesn't mean it's a time to be not nice. It's just that a lot of, I think people think that if they're just nice to everyone, then, that, then they're, not, they're not a racist and everything's fine. That's what I meant by that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that at base, a lot, a lot of us are interested in becoming ourselves more every day, and so transforming. And the this is an opportunity to learn more about the world. It's an opportunity to to become a better person, to build a better society. I I know, I know that I'm not sure. I think it's coming back, but I think. The, this kind of idealism became rather unpopular for a while. But I mean, I think, you know, we do have, as people, we have a moral core and um, listening to stories of injustice in which we're implicated is part of, um, part of what that moral core demands of us. Um, I guess it's sort of, a, it could be seen as a challenge. Like, what if? Can you hear this? Can you listen to it? What if it's true? Um, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I found that in white people challenging racism, most of the people that come to that workshop are ready to listen. So I mean, we don't have very many people that come and are like naysayers. But they're at various different places along the line. I, I don't. I guess asking people to, to, to connect this to their own experience, their own history. Um, yeah, I think that that's very important. Uh, that is certainly a tactic I use in my classes. Sometimes if we're talking about uh, someplace in Africa, I might jump back to the Habsburgs and <laughs> the House of Hanover and the consolidation of power in Europe so that people can start to see that there were certain processes that were happening in the world. And it wasn't Africa off by itself doing something weird. Well, the West was over there doing some other kind of distinctly human thing. And I think that's part of the problem. Maybe um, access to workshops, I know that um, I, one of the things that amazed me about the story of Mao in China is that they organized these community theaters and the plays always had themes of liberation and were teaching a political lesson. Uh, so I think something like that, even on our campus, if if uh, people were outdoors and did a little skit 
and people could walk by freely and look at it. It's not a coercion. It's not a requirement. But they don't have to go far to get to it. I think we need more things like that. Lulu, I see that you have your hand raised again. So I, I take it you want to, you have a follow up question. So I'm going to allow you to unmute. You should. No, they were they were great. They were great answers. I just find a lot of the time that people are willing to share information or read it, like on their phones or on social media. Yet when it comes to their day to day lives, um, they tend to not know how to take action nor are willing to listen to the stories that are right in front of them. Um, and so I was wondering in your experiences, how you can be able to combat that, but the answers were great. I do have one thing to say, Lulu, and yeah. that is the concept of accountability partnerships. And that's something that we've been weaving into our workshops. And there's a wonderful woman named Shamika Goddard, who is a, is, um, has sort of founded the area of tech chaplaincy. Anyway, she's doing a lot of work on these accountability partnerships, you know, in combating racism, but just also in daily life. That when you get together with a group of people and you share what you want to do or you discuss what you've read and what you can do about it, then you can hold each other accountable in non coercive ways by just like checking in with the person, say, hey, I, you were going to do such and such. Did you do it? can I do anything to help you? Um, what, what went wrong? Or, so I think that doing things together, creating, building community and building anti-racist community is really important because the idea is that you're supposed to be very isolated. You know, you know, that kind of response when you raise an issue and dead silence. But when you get a community, then you have more strength to do that. Thank you so much. Uh, other students, any other students who would like to, um, to ask a question before I open it up to the rest of the audience? Um, I see no more student hands. Uh, you're, you're welcome students to continue to raise your hand, but I do want to open it up to the rest of our uh, gathering. Anyone else uh, who would like to ask a question of our speakers? Or make a comment. Or make a comment, absolutely. Yes, engage in any way you wish. Um, I see um, Professor Goshgarian has her hand raised. I'm going to ask you to unmute. You should be able to speak. Um, I do have a question, but there's a student that was raising her hand. Um, Amy, mm -hmm. I don't see her last name, but I don't think you saw her. She, she didn't do it digitally or whatever. Oh, okay. No, I, and I'm not able to see everyone because I'm monitoring the, um, the participant list. So Amy, we can start with you and then we'll come back to, to you, uh, Rachel. Uh, Amy, you first. Hi, thank you. <laughs> I was raising my hand, but um, I noticed in your conversation, um, you brought up that you um, wrote the book, um, Misremembering Dr. King. And that title itself kind of uh, stuck out to me because I've noticed that a lot of students and um, people in my community, um, when the protests and this movement really gained its energy, um, people were using Dr. King's um, ideas and words to describe the protests. And I was wondering how can our schools and our education in particular um, work to kind of like validify Dr. King in a much better way than it already is? And how can it work to kind of update its curriculum and teaching students that um, these people are not just these fragmentary ideas? That's a really good question. I think um, Dr. King is being remembered more and more accurately. Um, and people are having, you know, using his brilliant work as a resource more and more. Yet, um, there is this, I mean, I wrote the book because people were remembering him. They weren't remembering what he was really talking about, which was pretty radical. Um, but I think people are starting to remember that. How to change the curriculum? I will have to leave that to your, <laughs> to the people who are actually, you know, 
teaching. Um, but I know even locally in our community, there's some teachers at the high school who are interested in, you know, building a curriculum around, around this book, um, but particularly to talk about social justice issues and to sort of bring back his memory to a more accurate place. I'm sorry, I'm not able to come up with a prescription, but maybe some of the other people have ideas. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to go to, um, to Professor Goshgarian and then we have um, uh, two more hands and I will go to Alma Scott Buzek and, and John Clark after that. So Rachel, it's all yours. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you, Wendy, for organizing. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I think lots of us seem to be trying to ask these very specific questions, like what can we do to make a difference, right? And I know that each institution has sort of different problems, um, and I really liked what Professor Wilson Fall said about, you know, convincing people that, that this is not just something that they have to do for black people, that this is something that we need to do for our entire society. Um, and I guess I'm just, I'm going to ask a very concrete question, which is oftentimes in this moment, it seems like so many of my colleagues and friends who are black Americans or African Americans are providing resources uh, for p others to read films, to, for books to read, films to watch. I'm wondering in all of your work that you've done with your um, white people challenging racism, um, where, what, what kinds of resources do you use? Are there specific websites that you go to? And I understand this is a very concrete question, but I, I would like to be able to go to resources that have been prepared by specialists and not always call on people that are already overburdened and providing, um, and providing uh, materials to read. The other question, or I guess maybe it's a thought that I have, is some of our students are really doing amazing work right now, and I just want to acknowledge that. Um, there's a new Instagram page that's been up, I think, literally for two days, and it already has 663 followers called Black at Loft. And it's sharing lots of stories of the kinds of racism and discrimination that African American and other students of color have experienced at Lafayette's campus. And I think it's really in some ways being very transformational already. Um, but again, to get to sort of, I think what Lulu was even asking about, um, be, I think because of this page, one of my, um, uh, my, one of my alum, or students who, or former students received an apology from a white student uh, who had done something racist to them. And, um, but the apology really felt more about the white student than it did about the alum who was writing me about it. So how do we move people from recognizing and understanding that they've done something racist or participated in a racist activity? How do we take them from apologizing for themselves to committing to action and understanding that an apology is sometimes a very empty seeming to, a, to, to an individual who has been, you know, consistently kind of um, discriminated against and oftentimes in very personal ways on the, on the floor they lived on at Lafayette College. I mean, how do, how do you, what do you see as helping people to move from one step to the other step? I mean, also, Wendy, if you feel like answering that. I'll let Jennifer go first. Well, I would go back to the issue of repair. You know, the, an apology ideally would invite uh, input, you know, like, what can I do to, is there something I can do? What can I do? Um, and, and sometimes that may be poorly received because like, why don't you go figure it out yourself? Uh, which is a perfectly reasonable response. Um, so I, I think when we realize that we've done something racist, which is sort of inevitable, um, that the apology has to also, it, there has to be a way of um, asking like, how can I, how can I make this whole, how can I make this relationship whole again? Can I make this relationship whole again? Mm -hmm. And then doing the work. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, I love Jim Keenan, the way he says, you know, own it and fix it, um, which is easier said than done. I mean, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, in practical terms, I think it would be interesting if each, uh, we create some other kind of cross 
cutting units like maybe the dormitories themselves, where students commit to doing some of this work. And some of the things are very small, and if they were sort of um, not monitored, but if there was some kind of stewardship on the part of faculty. For example, a lot of my students of color joke that when they leave class, none of the white students from their class remember them. They never speak to them when they're walking across campus. But I don't think the white students even think about that. But that's one thing that people could talk about with some stewardship that doesn't necessarily have to get out of hand. So um, maybe working with student organizations to build up some kind of an um, itinerary of conversations uh, might be one way to, to approach that. I want to make sure we give uh, others a chance. Alma Scott Buzak, I am asking you to unmute so you have a chance to, to speak. Okay, um, my, it's more of a comment and a challenge than it is a question. So um, I've been in Bob Whitlock yet for a long, long time in a number of different capacities. And as quickly as possible, 40 years ago as a student, I remember sitting in a dean's office and talking to the administration about how as black students, we did not feel welcome, engaged with the community or part of the community. And then I came back in the 80s as a volunteer and I met with students of color again, mainly black and some brown students who again told me stories of not feeling involved, feeling discriminated against, not feeling safe on our campus, not feeling like white students and white faculty and administrators were actually trying to connect with them. And then I come back in the 90s as a member of the board and I sit with students and I hear the exact same issues, the exact same concerns, the exact same challenges. And now as a staff member, when I hear from students, I hear the same, and from faculty and from staff, mm -hmm. same challenges, the same issues, the same concerns. And while I think, so I have always thought of white, of Lafayette as a white institution that has welcomed me into it, but not really made me a part of it. And I feel that that may be a um, reaction that is shared by other people who are black and brown in this institution. So here's the challenge. I need the school to stop trying to fix us and to really think about how you as the white majority at Lafayette think about the way that you interact with our students and our faculty and staff of color in ways that really do make them part of the community. Because I don't think we've gotten there yet. And I know that everyone's on this call. I know many of you personally, and I know that you really want to do the right thing about this. But I think the real challenge is that the work is hard and it's individual. And it is about you and not about the black student or the black faculty or the black administrator we really need to change the culture of the college. So I don't know if Wendy or the do doctor would like to make any, tell me to shut up, it's okay, but that's <laughs> the reaction as we're having this conversation. <laughs> uh, to Lafayette, we have too much so that other people can uh, talk and I know Dr. Yanko might want to say something. I, I'll say two things. One is that in working in political change, we have to understand that we can't, we're, the problems we have mirror the problems of the country. So it's hard to get beyond what the larger environment is like. But as you suggest, and I'm just saying that so we're not too hard on ourselves, but we're going to try in increments to do the type of thing that you're talking about. Uh, to give you an example, I don't think uh, most white people are ever used to thinking well, I'm having a party, but there's nobody of color at my party. They may be very nice people, 
but they, it doesn't occur to them. There are no brown people, there are no black people at their party, even though they see them at work every day. Now, this isn't a plea for me to get invited to parties. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. But I am not the only person of color. So I think that's another sort of easy thing. It just doesn't occur to people. It's just that people are just socialized to not see that. And I turn that over to Dr. Yanko because I know we're running out of time. Um, just thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, because I think it is important that we, you know, look at our own institutions and it's, it seems in this, in this, like so many cases, it's, it goes back to this question of willful ignorance and empathy um, because it's not occurring to these students that the black or students of color might feel unwelcome. It's not even occurring to us. They're just indifferent, never, never thought about it. And so how, and this goes back to Lulu's question, I think, how do you, how do we, um, how do you create spaces? And I think you can do it in one institution, which makes a bright spot for other institutions to look at. I mean, we have to start where we are, um, but creating um, context in which white students, especially, can examine, you know, really study their history and their selves right now and the society that they're living in and start looking, taking the veil off and looking at what's going on and also being able to hear and wanting to hear the experiences that you were just speaking about. Like you're saying, uh, uh, it uh, welcomed me in, but didn't make me feel part of it. You know, for all these years, it would seem that the institution could find ways to hear that out, you know, really hear it out, want to hear it and want to hear how that manifests. And so what needs to change? What repairs need to be made? What, how, how can that be different? Um, and I think a lot of it's, you know, um, exchange, discussion, um, hearing, listening. I'd like to, I know we're running out of time. I have three raised hands. So I do want to call on John Clark next. And then I have Lulu uh, who would like to share something again, as well as Rachel. So let me start with John Clark and then we will wind this uh, down. Um, Hi, um, first I wanted to thank um, Wendy and Dr. Yanko for this conversation. I just really helpful. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I guess I just sort of have a comment and not a question. Um, it, I guess it, it, it tends towards the, the preaching to the choir aspect, the, you know, the sympathetic folks who, who, who want to get involved. Um, I'm from Eastern Maine, and I stay in touch with hundreds of people I grew up with on Facebook. And it gives me a, some insight. Um, I have a lot of racist friends. Um, I mean, not, I mean, I recognize that there's racism within myself, but when I see racist posts on Facebook from people I've known for 40, 50 years, um, it's never about black people. It's about, I support the police. And so I'm trying to get to fix my community, which is a rural, deindustrializing, predominantly white part of America, um, when people aren't even willing to acknowledge that they're talking about race. Mm. So I'll, I'll toss that out for, you know, when we go out of these sympathetic precincts, what do we do? Are we I'm gonna just, uh, give you a shared example from going to a pharmacy. I won't name it, but it's a national company. You all could probably guess who it is. And I went to this uh, pharmacy, John, and um, my son came out of the pharmacy and he said, why don't black people ever look you in the eye when you go to buy something? And I said, well, you know, part of it is confidence and part of it is training. 
And I have seen this at many different branches of this national pharmacy where uh, young people of color who get the job are not trained. So they're not told to look people in the eye. Uh, they don't look engage the customer and then they end up looking bad. And people end up saying, oh, there they go again, those black people. Blah, blah, blah. So I was even wondering, should I go to the place and say, you know, have you trained your people to look people in the eye? I think it's that kind of, that level of personal willingness to put yourself into it. Thank you very much for your comment. Yeah, I guess I would agree with that willingness to put yourself into it because it's only as we start, you know, more and more people speak up that the culture of silence can change. So um, calling calling out these friends, I mean, just, you just with a simply, oh, that's interesting that you come to that conclusion. I don't, I don't agree with it. Um, rather than silence, which sort of condones it, I guess, just figuring out ways to say, no, I don't agree, I don't agree. Thank you. Um, Lulu, you're next. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what we were saying about ways that Lafayette can create different forums or um, places in, yeah, not even places, forums, conversations that we can use to talk about these issues. But even when it seems that Lafayette tries to do this here, like, I'll give an example. Recently, Lafayette put forward, or the communications division put forward um, the change makers, which I think they're going to make a, um, a continuous story of different weeks uh, throughout different weeks. Um, however, the first story was about the school-wide fundraiser, which I know there's a lot of faculty on here, but it was a student-run fundraiser by the Diversity and Inclusion Committee in student government. And we raised over $20,000, which was a huge, wow. huge, um, yeah, it was a huge accomplishment. And it was run by two Black women. And when Lafayette covered the story through the com communications division, they didn't interview them. And they interviewed um, one of the women who was a part of it, um, who was a part of the three of them who ran it. But then they also, um, they also interviewed the student body president. While, while she is the president of student government, she wasn't the head of the diversity inclusion committee, which ran this fundraiser. Um, which had over 25 different organizations, a part of it. So then it seems that Lafayette wants to implement this change makers storyline. But even when it seems that the institution itself is willing to listen and learn, somehow the opportunities to do so still are missed. Um, and so I always kind of come back to how even when, even when the institution says they want to listen, even when they say they want to learn, how do we make them not miss these like very obvious points? Because um, now these two women, these two black women who ran this fundraiser, their voices have not been empowered at all. Whoa. So, yeah, so if there's, it's an overall question to anybody. How do you, how do you not <laughs> miss these things? I, I think Dr. Yanko told us to keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> that there are going to be challenges. Mm -hmm. And we have to take for granted there are going to be challenges. And, and if I may jump in here, I'm sorry, Lou, I'm not one of the speakers, but I would encourage students to reach out, to reach out to the administration, to reach out to communications. Um, you know, uh, intent and impact are important. It doesn't matter uh, whether what the impact, intent was, impact is important. 
And sometimes we just have to keep the education ongoing. It doesn't matter whether we're students or staff or faculty, we all have to educate. And so I would encourage you and the others to write to, write to any of us um, asking that we attend to this and, and bringing it to our attention. Often we, people don't know, uh, even those who may be able to make that change may not know it, it, you know, it's too late by the time the story has run, for example. So feel free to reach out. And it's probably not too late to, to raise up these two women who did all this work. And, and to perhaps with a mea culpa, you know, that we blew it, which is part of the whole thing. We right. blew it. Look, here's an example of how it's, how white supremacy is operating in our institution. We didn't even know it. So this is a chance for us to know it and to deal with it rather than saying, oh, well, we didn't mean it. So, yeah, it's definitely been brought up to the communications and they reached out to the two women who ran it, but now um the the woman who was reporting on it had been like referred to them to speak to them but she didn't and so now they just don't want to give a statement to the school so that's just to say that you know the Lafayette as an institution who like which has been here for hundreds of years has so many connections so many alums so many so many resources um they could have they could have like empowered these voices and now those women don't want to give their voices to this institution anymore because they feel as if they're just going to use them so I'm, it's being I'm, yeah i'm sorry to interrupt i do want to say that witnesses are important mm -hmm. and if those women don't want to talk there are a lot of other people around them who can still be witnesses and highlight this story yeah so i think it, it's harder when you're younger um, but it takes um, repeated efforts, chipping, chipping, chipping away, and maybe finding ways to get back together with each other to encourage each other. Mm. But I also know that we only have, we're really already beyond our time. Yeah. Mm. And I think Professor Goshgarian wanted to say something. Yeah. So, but maybe um, you could get back in touch with whoever you would like to. Mm -hmm. And we can talk together about uh, ways to follow this up, Lou. And I know that our VP for Communications is on this call, and I'm sure we will have an opportunity um, to make amends. And and I, I think um, you know, what Dr. Yanko says is absolutely, uh, you know, on uh, on target that we should be. This should be a mea culpa. Uh, yeah, I think it's an actually amazing learning experience to say, yeah. oh, we don't know how it's operating here at Lafayette, but oh, here's an example. And let's use this example to examine. Right. Mm -hmm. I will, I, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Rachel Goshkarian and then uh, we will say, um, we will say our final farewell. Uh, one moment. Um, so my, it's not really a question. I mean, actually, I would like to know how I can make it, make a change in this, if maybe Dean Bukwala, if you have any suggestions. Um, but to go, to go back to sort of creating community where it doesn't feel like a PWI, where then there are some brown people and black people. I mean, when I realized that Lafayette has a tiered housing system, I was shocked and dismayed. And I think that this tiered housing system uh, it encourages classism and also therefore encourages segregation. And I, I, I'm really disappointed in the institution that it has something that, where students are literally housed from their first semester on campus according to how much money their parents can pay. And I think it is, it's really to all the students' detriment. I mean, it is to the, it is to, it's a loss of a wonderful potential experience of learning from people who are different to them on, in every way. And uh, I don't know how to change that, but I think it would be a remarkable thing for the college to change. Um, in order to really create more of a community. Sorry if that sounds too impassioned, but I think it's really a terrible thing that exists at this college. Um, sounds like a fantastic opportunity also. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, uh, Rachel. I do know that the, the Committee on Student Life brought up the same issue. So I do think that, that it's an important conversation to have. And, and I think, you know, the council will follow up. All of the suggestions that we get, the council tries to follow up on. We're meeting with public safety, for example, to talk about 
um, you know, the presence of public safety officers and, and the Eastern police on campus and the experiences our students have shared. So uh, I, I will say that much as I would want uh, to see big changes in a very short period of time, I'm gonna ask for patience, um, but for you to know that we are, we will do, we will follow up on, on every single um, matter. We had in a town hall recently, a student mentioned the use of racial slurs in, in, in a class within the context of, of, of some reading material. And, and we followed up on that um, as well with, with that particular, trying to really find out more about what, what happened. I haven't talked to the student, but what I do know is that the faculty member was someone who came in just for that semester, no longer with us. Um, but when we have incidents of, of, you know, that occur in the classroom, we do try to follow up. So bring it to us um, is all I can say, and we will try to do the best that we can. Um, with that, I just, I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Thank you to, to Dr. Yanko. Thank you to Professor Wilson Fall um, for, for giving us your time and really sharing uh, what are incredibly valuable insights and, and really um, showing us the way uh, to, to, to start thinking about change and making change. Um, thank you all for taking time on a Friday to be with us and do come back on Monday at three o'clock. We, um, we have another event on media literacy and, and for example, the portrayal of looting uh, that we've been seeing uh, and really the racist, um, you know, projections of, of looting uh, in, in the media and, and how we can be more literate about that. So thank you all. I'm going to, um, to, to clap and applaud and say thank you very, very much.